So we have um, three speakers from Theme One talking today. So Rose Pudel, Banu Jagalinki, and uh, Kenneth McGinnis. And there's uh, many more people in Theme One who are working on protein engineering and using it to study uh, protein evolution. Uh, so the work that they're talking about actually represents uh, the larger work of the theme. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce Soros. Soros um, joined our, our group close to the beginning of the, the NASA project. He did his PhD uh, at, Man at uh, University of Montana with um, Eric uh, Boyd and is currently um, leading bioinformatics efforts uh, in our group. So I'll hand it over to Soros. Good afternoon, everyone, and, and thank you for being here. And uh, thank you, Dr. Lee, for a great talk. I think it's a great segue of what he talked about and where Vic left yesterday. And I'm going to pick up from there and then and continue talking about uh, designing ancestral protein or what we call that chain. Uh, so for today, I'm going to talk or go over two main projects that I've been working with uh, Josh, Doug, and Alexi. So I want to start by revisiting the figure. Uh, credit to Vic for moving this beautiful figure. Um, and Paul already talked about this, but uh, what I want to remind is, is our main hypothesis right here. So uh, basically, a short peptide anywhere from five to ten residue could have existed in, in, in early Earth. And depending on the environment and then the mineral, the available mineral, it could actually use those minerals to make uh, electron transferring proteins or catalytic proteins. That eventually evolved to become really complex enzymes that, we know, that exist today. So to reiterate um, theme one's goal, or at least the, the goal of this project, is to design prebiotic or biotic electron transferring protein or catalytic protein. So the reason I put biotic here is, is we're thinking about protein that was found likely at a uh, last university common ancestor. And then prebiotic force is, is pre-life. So ultimately, we would uh, um, want to get to the origin of metabolism, and, and it's really important to understand how these electron transfer protein evolved. And through yesterday's uh, talk, we we now have a general understanding that uh, in order to for this uh, really complex catalytic protein to work, we need these uh, electron transferring unit to to be present in in those complex protein, right? So be, by understanding how these uh, emerge and evolve. We'll be able to understand how these uh, oxidoreductases or uh, catalytic protein emerge. So, a um, few examples of, of uh, electron transferring protein include ferrodoxin. Um, these are really simple proteins, some around 50 to 80 amino acids. It uses uh, two four ions of a cluster. Uh, depending on the ferrodoxin, it could also have one four ions of a cluster, as shown by uh, yellow and, and blue sphere. Um, th this is the most commonly found paradoxin. You could almost say that uh, paradoxin is universally, almost universally found in all living organisms. Other examples include uh, cytochrome that uses heme as a cofactor, uh, flavodoxin that uses flavin as a cofactor, and cuprodoxin that uh, you talked about. Actually, I just put this like a couple of minutes ago <laughs> um, as a copper. So these, these three enzymes, copper uh, protein, uh, cytochrome, flavodoxin, and cuprodoxin, they're also widely found in um, all three domains of life, perhaps not as much as ferrodoxin. Um, so going to catalytic proteins, um, when we think about uh, origin of life, two of the enzymes are, are, are importantly discussed, uh, hydrogenase and, and nitrogenase. And, and for today's talk, I'm just going to focus on hydrogenase, and perhaps next year um, we'll be able to talk more on nitrogenase. So, um, Thinking about hydrogen is it really does a very simple reaction. So it takes hydrogen and it splits into two protons and two electrons. So the uh, and it dumps those electrons to an electron acceptor. So in this case, uh, typically it's, it's ferrodoxin. So then now ferrodoxin can uh, act as an electron donor in downstream metabolic processes, right? So again, it's it's a very simple reaction. All it does is, is oxidizes hydrogen. You can also do a reverse reaction where it takes two protons and two electrons and make hydrogen. So why hydrogen is, is really important. So uh, if you remember Paul, he talked about yesterday where uh, he said that wood lung pathway is probably the, uh, the first metabolic pathway, right? So I'm not showing you here wood lung but the first step in wood lung pathway is being able to use hydrogen. So the only enzyme that can use uh, or metabolize um, hydrogen is hydrogen, right? So that explains why hydrogen or hydrogen is really an important enzyme. So now that, 
the question here is if it's such a simple reaction, why does it why does this enzyme be really complex? It's it's multimeric. Uh, what that means is it has different subunits. And if you take a closer look at it, it has multiple uh, cofactors. So bringing back uh, the figure that Vic uh, talked about yesterday is basically deconstructing the gosmos, right? So you see this three iron sulfur cluster uh, that all it does is, is act as an electron tunnel. So it's, it's um, allowing the electrons to move from the substrate to the catalytic site, which is uh, shown here as a red and green, which is nickel and iron. So I'm showing you here is a nickel ion hydrosomes. So basically this hydrosin is, is, is a combination of three ferrofoxin and one catalytic site, right? So again, if you want to understand how hydrosin is evolved, you really need to understand these uh, electron transferring units. So uh, a few years ago, uh, Doug and, and, and John, basically they worked on designing uh, a ferrodoxin. So what they did was they looked at natural uh, protein and uh, came up with 12 M 12 amino acid long residue, a cyclic residue shown here on the right. So uh, uh, what they did was they actually used uh, L and B amino acids. So for those of you who don't know what that means, it's uh, each of the 20 amino acids, 19 have uh, um, R chiral. So what that means is think of it as your hand. So your hand has a mirror image, right? So one hand in the mirror image of the other. So the 19 residue also have a mirror image and which we refer to as L and D amino acids. So uh, interestingly, if you look at organisms now, they extensively use only L amino acids. Um, why did nature decide that? And I guess it's a thing we can discuss in our discussion uh, session later on. But um, so what that tells us about this prebiotic, uh, this peptide is basically the fact that we used L and D amino acids means that this peptide can be synthesized inside a cell, or at least it can't exist in nature right now. So basically it has to be prebiotic. Right? So pre pre life. So if if a protein as this existed, then it will exist before life. Pretty interesting and pretty fascinating, right? So uh, and when we looked at the catalytic site, it it uh, um, catalytic activity, uh, it behaves like uh, natural ferrodoxin. So the redox range is similar to natural ferrodoxin, and, and it could uh, take electrons and dump electrons, so go through multiple cycles without being um, um, sacrificial. So with this, we can also explore another uh, territory where uh, um, we were fortunate to collaborate with Dr. Michael Hecht at, at Princeton, where he basically looks at or focusing on designing this four helix bundle, synthetic novel four helix bundle. So uh, his design are pretty neat where he selects residues in such a way that when protein full, all the hydrophobic residues are at the core facing each other and uh, shown as uh, orange in here. And uh, all hydrophilic residues are facing outward to the solution, right? So what that does is makes this complex really rigid and really stable. And at the same time, it's really uh, flexible. So you can mutate a few residues here and there and, and, and still maintain the structure um, of this complex. So he published this uh, structure uh, a few years ago, uh, essay 24. So the question we wanted to ask was, okay, so can we mutate through the residues in this complex and, and can we add four ounces of a cluster? And uh, there, there can, then comes DJB1. So what we did was we uh, uh, mutated a few of the residues. So when we think about parents of a cluster, it typically, at least in nature, it, it seems that it uses cysteine, uh, four cysteine to coordinate parents of a cluster. Of course, there are other residues that, as, as we showed before, but um, we, we decided to go with cysteine and then try to see if it can bind parents of a cluster. And, uh, so uh, basically our structure has cysteine in each of the helices and then and can coordinate um, uh, four ends of a cluster. So now it looks like a ferrodoxin, right? So then, but can it behave like a ferrodoxin? So looking at the uh, activity of, of a DZAB1, shown here on the left is the EPR plot. So for those of you who don't know what an EPR is, it's basically in a method where you can see if, you're, if your species has an unpaired level, right? So think of it as an, um, oxidize and reduce. If it's an oxidized and it doesn't have that uh, unpaired electron, and if it's reduced, then it has just accepted an electron, so it has that unpaired electron. So the orange line here, uh, what it's showing is DZB1 is oxidized, and it doesn't have that unpaired electron. And then the two peaks here, uh, the, you, the distinct two peaks shows that our DZB1 is reduced. Uh, in other words, it, it's, it, it has just accepted uh, an, an, an electron. So depending on the type of metal, we, we get uh, distinct signatures. Uh, so in this case, we know that this is DZB1, 
And, and the fact that we see this, these peaks in EPR suggests that our, our protein can actually be reduced and oxidized. And that's important for electron transferring proteins, right? Because they should be able to take electrons and dump electrons and, and continue that cycle. And further support comes from this uh, U one point EV spectra on the right. So what this is showing here um, uh, on X axis is, is the voltage. We're uh, looking at a wide range of voltage trying to see if it behaves like a natural paradoxical. So the point here, uh, each dot, the red dots, represents a different state of these AB1. So we looked at the literature and then said, okay, so how do natural paradoxins uh, behave at a different range? And it turns out at, at uh, negative 190 millivolts, uh, natural paradoxin, which uh, um, is partially assembled with three iron and four sulfur, right? And, and the fact that our DZB is at the same spot basically suggests that our DZB is probably also partially assembled at that redox potential. And then when we look at uh, negative 345, it, it's, it's fully assembled. And, and again, so uh, the fact that it's, it's really aligning with how natural paradoxin behaves suggests that our DZB1 could also uh, be a, uh, or, or replacement to a natural paradox. Now, the other thing what we could do here is, is we can add multiple uh, boron sulfur cluster, and perhaps we could also add nickel iron hydroxide and make this uh, um, a full hydroxide as itself. So that's, that's uh, something that we can think about uh, for the next, uh, in, in future. But, so what I showed you here is two models of of electron transferring proteins, right? One is uh, uh, ambidoxin, which is L and D amino acids. And again, that can be synthesized in a cell and the other is DJB. So this one here, it uses all L, L amino acids. So it can be synthesized in a cell. So, so, um, okay. So what, what we saw is, is Actually, we, we can make this simple electron transferring proteins. And then now we have, we have two models. We can actually focus on the catalytic site as well and ask questions as can we simplify this catalytic site and, and make a simple hydrogen? So, um, so me, Josh, and Doug, we, uh, we started uh, taking a different approach and then designed a different hydrogen. And then, of the many designs that we had, it, it turns out to be uh, uh, 2PAL turns out to be the best. And then from the, for the remaining talks, I'm just going to focus on 2PAL. So what Josh started with was a natural protein that contained calcium as a cofactor. And what we did was we looked at a nickel and we since we know the protein environment, we wanted to mimic that protein environment in this uh, natural 2PAL protein. So we mutated through the residues. So basically what we did was we uh, mutated uh, um, them to 16 so that it can coordinate uh, uh, nickel. And we ran through uh, Vic's uh, PRODCAT in silico uh, approach. What that does is it basically gives us a minimum energy stable structure that can coordinate nickel, right, as, as shown in here. So if you remove all the residues, it basically look like this as, as uh, the 416 that can coordinate uh, nickel. Right, so now that we have a, a stable structure, we wanted to uh, look at the activity if it can uh, function as a hydrogenase or not. So shown here is a cyclic voltammetry. So for this, we collaborated with Dr. Kate uh, at uh, Department of Chemistry at Rutgers. So uh, what cyclic voltammetry does is it basically allows us to, use to see if our, uh, um, our enzyme is catalytic or not. So on the x-axis is basically uh, voltage, so range of voltage, and on y-axis is the amount of current. So one of the interesting things about our peptide is it can work in both aerobic and anaerobic settings. Now that's really exciting, right? So that we don't have to worry about aerobic uh, when we do experiments. So how do I tell that our uh, um, protein is catalytic or not? So, if you, so in CV, if, if it's catalytic, it shows a distinct peak, as you can see in blue and red. So red here is, is in anaerobic conditions, and then blue is in um, aerobic conditions. So, so the black here, let's we'll start with black here, which is buffer. So meaning it doesn't have any protein. So um, since it has no protein, it shouldn't be showing any catalytic activity, right? So then we don't see any distinct peak. But then for aerobic and anaerobic, we see this peak at the same spot. So roughly around at negative uh, one, one volt, right? So what's really happening is, is throughout this time, it's, the current is constantly passing, but as soon as it reaches somewhere around negative one volt, our enzyme is able to uh, accept electrons. In other words, it's, it can be reduced 
and it gets to a point where all of the uh, uh, these peptides are, are reduced, and, and and you can dump electrons uh, to whatever the electron acceptor is in the in the solution. And then we we believe that it's it's hydrogen. We haven't tested that yet, uh, um, unfortunately, because of COVID, we have to stop our experiments. But uh, that's the that's the hypothesis that it's 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 hydrogen. So this is really exciting, right? So uh, independent of um, Aerobic or anaerobic settings, our uh, our enzyme is is really unaffected, and it can it can actually produce uh, a hydrogen. So we actually did uh, a preliminary results before conducting the CV, where we uh, put uh, our solution in a vial. This is this is this was done in anaerobic. This was uh, before we knew that it could also uh, function in anaerobic condition. So we took a methyl vialysin and, and tested for a hydrogen activity. So on x axis is the time, so that basically uh, is how much time it, it needs to go through that column, that GC column. Um, so compared to control, so the control only had nickel, so it didn't have any peptides. So uh, um, it, the fact that it doesn't show any hydrogen production, and, and with our tool it shows hydrogen, basically means that our peptide is able to produce hydrogen. So this is really exciting, right? Um, Unfortunately, again, due to COVID, we can't really work. But meantime, what uh, we did was uh, took our data and we wanted to understand how uh, our peptide is, is uh, producing hydrogen. So uh, the first thing we did was we looked at our, our CV data where we titrated it in different pH. So, um, okay, so like I mentioned before, when you think of a hydrogen, all it needs is two protons and two electrons, right? So then it will definitely get affected by the pH because pH is all about how much proton you have in the solution. So when we subject our peptide to uh, a pH of 10, um, we almost don't see any activity, right? And, and the same goes at pH of 8, but then we start seeing some activity at, at pH somewhere around 5. And then as we go lower and lower, we start, the activity increases as shown by the amount of current that our peptide is, is, is taking. Right, so then what this, this indicates is, is, you know, in order for our peptide to show catalytic activity, it needs to be somewhere around a pH of 5. And why is that the case? This is just a working hypothesis. Uh, if you look at the structure on the right, um, on, again, remember uh, I mentioned that uh, nickel is coordinated by four cysteine, right? So it, it, it so happens that at pH 5, the two of the cysteine, it doesn't have to be these two cysteines, it could be any of the two cysteines, it's getting protonated. So when I say protonated, it basically means it's, it's accepting the two protons, protons, right? And, and as soon as it gets uh, electrons, then it deprotonates, meaning it, it can cleave this these uh, two, two protons that it accepted to make hydrogen. Right. So this is just a working hypothesis, and, and of course we need to do more uh, biochemical factorization to make sure that that's how it's 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 working. But meantime, a uh, question to our geo team is: is um, uh, one of the things that we noticed when we were re reconstituting this this peptide was as soon as you put nickel into the solution, it, it, the solution gets cloudy. Right. Uh, in, in other words, it almost would want to precipitate. But then, as soon as we add our peptide, it, the the solution becomes really clear. So what that suggests is, is can we uh, find an environment where there's a constant rock weathering, uh, rock as in that has a uh, high nickel content? So then, can we put our peptide in that environment? And be, at least looking at our solution, it should be able to instantly bind nickel and then actually make a uh, hydroxide. So then what type of rock and then what type of environment should we be looking for or should we start thinking about when we think if these kind of peptides existed in, in, in ancient earth or even uh, in an ancient earth. So uh, for future directions, uh, I think the first priority would be to definitely finish Hygosinus project and, uh, and after this completion we would Definitely want to investigate other catalytic enzymes such as nitrosamines, like I mentioned before. Uh, hopefully, we can have some results uh, next year, and, and and also talk about carbon dioxide dehydrogenase. And, uh, and again, the, the idea is is to get to the root of the metabolism. Um, with that, I would like to thank everyone that's involved in the team and uh, NASA and then uh, NASA for Stockholm Fellowship. Uh, thank you. All right, we have a, a minute or two for any questions to Rose. I see there's one here in the chat. Um, 
uh, cyclic voltammetry at femto amps resolution. John, do you want to expand on that? Um, Josh, are you here? No, I was just wondering why uh, the intensity was so small, because uh, I know you guys were making milligrams of samples, right? Yeah, um, actually, Josh did the CV, so... Um... It's not the, uh, we're not using uh, the same size electrode, reason is small, uh, um, uh, three millimeter uh, surface area electric. So the, it's different than the one you're, you were using the peg, the glossy right. carbon electrode. And yeah, yeah. So was there a reason why you guys couldn't use the, the conventional method? Uh, Kate said that uh, this is what they typically do for hydrogenases, so we went we went and did that. Oh, okay. <laughs> she she does uh um uh creates like small molecule hydrogenases, so I see. she may have been uh, biased towards that. I see. But you'll be wasting a lot of sampling with with that strategy, though, right? Um. Can you recover your sample uh, after the experiment? Like five milliliter uh, volumes, about 500 micromolar. Okay. I'm just amazed at, you know, how sensitive her instrument is, you know, just with, with very little noise at femto amp level. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Okay. All right. That's, that's it. Yeah. All right. Maybe one more question. I see there's one from Julian. Uh, yeah, uh, nice talk. Um, I was wondering, uh, talked about the, the pH dependence of the activity and hydrogen evolution. Um, and so, so clearly, I mean, your pH obviously gives you basically a, a tenfold increase per pH unit of one of your substrates, right? So this is something that, that uh, you see a lot in, in, in research about any hydrogen or no hydrogen evolution catalyst. It is very pH dependent, and a lot of them are only working at low pH. So um, I was wondering maybe if, if if that's the reason versus the the protonation of the cysteine. You know that they basically you need a lot of driving force for this catalyst, and you only reach that at low pH where you have high abundance of high concentration of protons, and and that shifts your thermodynamics. And also, by the way, it shifts your um, it shifts your potential right for for hydrogen evolution. Yeah, I can answer that if you like, Sarosh. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, so so we were at first we were a little surprised to not see um, a change in activity that's proportional with pH at any range. Uh, but yeah, you're what you're what you're saying. We think is is what's going on um, based on DFT calculations. The pK of cysteine bound to nickel. Is anywhere from like three to five, and and that's that's basically what we're seeing in in, in our experiments, where at pH five, essentially, suddenly you get um, this massive effect in the activity that's proportional to the amount of of reactants in this case. Um, but prior to approaching the pKa of the cysteine bound to nickel, um, pH doesn't really affect the activity, and it's and it's almost not active at all. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, 